local printmaker. Uh, everybody, please welcome Mo Galaccio. Um, thanks very much, Paul. Um, can you hear me? Can you see me? Do I need to do anything? Yes, I'm, is everything okay? We can see you. Um, I'd just like to say thank you very much um, for letting me represent Forest Poets tonight with this special reading with Pascal, and also to congratulate you on all the readings that you've organised. Um, yes, I'm representing Scotland, and for people who don't know me, um, I was born and mostly brought up in Scotland, but I've got English parents, so I'm bilingual. And when I started to write, some of the poems came out in Scots and some of them come out in English. So you just have to take your choice. Um, I'm only reading um, two short poems um, today. Um, the first one is a lockdown poem and it's called The State of Things. I thought to try a boasting sonnet but found it nothing much to brag about. A long lived life and full of incident, the tool vouch that it has been well spent. In isolation of snail to a crawl, no sourdough baked, no masterpiece, no novel. Bees bumble, fumble, putting me to shame. Procrastination's now my middle name. I tried to stem the tide. I did my best to stop the war and every nuclear test, I failed. In spite of my endeavors, I fear the Tories will be in forever. I'm planting up my garden with lavender and pinks, a diversionary tactic. This government stinks. And now spring, I wandered lonely as a cloud. That's, I'll just start again there. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high or vale and hills. When all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze. Wordsworth's daffodils. Mine daffodils are the Tesco variety. Promises. Picked at dawn for meagre pay by frozen fingered migrant workers, bedded in makeshift villages of caravans, packed in boxes, airlifted, 10 stems in bud, scant leaves, secured by two elastic bands, a crate of graduated stripes, white through green to lemon. No fluttering or dancing, but at a pound a bunch, a vase full for my kitchen, each jaunty trumpet of fanfare, ta-da, da-da, yes. There will be spring. Thank you. Yay. Thank you so much, Mo Galaccio. And uh, I love that daffodil poem. Thank you very much for reading it. <laughs> uh, in fact, my daffodils that I bought for a pound have just died on me today. So it's nice to, it was almost like an elegy to them. Our next poet is Sophia Brandner. I met Sophia a couple of years ago, I think, at the Poetry Cafe when I used to run Poetry at Three on behalf of the Poetry Society. Um, and since then, Sophia has come and joined Forest Poets. Uh, her background is in photography and design. And as a poet and spoken word artist, she speaks of London life and consumer culture, the surreal and real happenings. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Sophia Brandner. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Do I sound all right? Okay, great. Um, thank you very much for that lovely introduction, Paul. And it's a pleasure to be part of this today, along with um, Mo, which I'm happy to have heard, and with Pascal Petit as well. So thank you very much. Um, I'll start with something inspired by lockdown. 
And that's this, as it's um, International Women's Day, it's going to be about women. So um, this is about a, a, a woman that I've noticed in my immediate neighbourhood, walking around. <clears throat> it's called Power Walk. Left, right, left, right. Stomp, stomp, stomp. She marches in the middle of the road. The four by fours have the audacity to park on her pavement. Stomp, stomp, stomp. She takes charge. Her long tussled rusty hair wildly sways with each bold step. With the power of a steam engine pulling along her weather shielded shopping trolley with a sense of urgency in open toe sandals and ankle socks, wearing a thin sheet with sleeves, a suggestion of a coat as it's winter, left unbuttoned, material flaps like the wing of a falcon taking flight, left, right, left, right, stomp, stomp, stomp. Faster than falling hailstones, she walks like a storm. And for my, my second one, um, it's called London's West End. From up above, they look down below. She can't be touched. Her words carry currency. She carries her knowledge in her heart. Welcomed all flock to her theatre of style, warmth and charm. A voice like a soothing balm. A touch of the exotic where you won't come to any harm. Carefully sealed, her inner desires will never be revealed. There's no chink in her armour. You'll see the humour, hear music, and feel the drama, an aura that glows and oozes like honey, a delight to engage in and part with your money. Bravo! <laughs> thank you very much, Sophia. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. And um, thank you to Sophia and to Mo for representing Forest Poets so beautifully. Uh, our main reader is Pascal Betty, whose current collection, Tiger Girl, you, is uh, out with Blood Axe, and it's already been shortlisted for the Forward Prize. Her seventh collection, Mama Amazonica, won the inaugural Laurel Prize for <laughs> Nature, and uh, at least four of her previous collections were shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot Prize. And Pascal is judge for this year's Forward Prize too. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Pascal Petit. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, am I unmuted? You are. Great. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, it's lovely to be in Walthamstow in spirit tonight um, because I lived there for thir 30 years, maybe 32 years altogether. And uh, it's really nice to be part of Forest Poets. And thank you so much to Mo for your very wonderful daffodil and the, the genesis of the daffodil. And to Sophia for your power walk, Falcon. So I'm going to, to read, first of all, I'm going to read from Tiger Girl. And then I have quite a few requests. And it's really lovely to have these requests because it meant that I didn't have to worry too much about choosing what to read because that can be quite hard. So I'll start with the Tiger Girl, a few of which are, are requests. And this is my grandmother, my Indian grandmother, who brought me up in, in Wales. 
her gypsy clothes. I used to wonder why my grandmother stared so hard into the fire, even after I found the cardboard box at the back of the coal house and drew out of it flame, chili, emerald, sequin sparks, embroidered mirrors orbiting wraparound skirts, shawls trimmed with seed pearls, silver bangles like Saturn's rings. Her embarrassment when she caught me trying them on and explained they were her gypsy rags to tell fortunes at fairs. Only at her funeral did the story come out. Her birth in Rajasthan to her father's maid. I think now of my great grandmother dancing for her master's guests, grateful to have her baby brought up as his wife's. I think of the coal grease, black dust and memories that burn slow as anthracite. How some colors don't fade, however deep they're buried. How even a dowry of rags smoldering in a box can flare in a winter grate. And how to own the country of her birth a woman might have to wear a fire. So during that poem, my cat made a grand exit through cat flap. I don't know if you could hear her. But speaking of cats, this is um, the, the story that my grandmother used to tell me about her childhood in India was of, um, of um, a tiger walking into her tent when she was a baby and she was all alone. So I tried to imagine that. And uh, so this is really spoken in her voice. And behind it is lurking Henri Rousseau's painting, um, Surprised, Tiger in a Tropical Storm. So surprised. When lightning flickers over my cot, and the air tingles with the electric charge of the great cat's fur. I cross into the night where my jungle tent is pitched. I am a child staring into green flames, wondering who is this angel crouched above me, her coat of icicles, her eyes like meteors shooting into my face. My hand is a brave monkey reaching up to touch her fangs while all the hairs of my body rise like wind in a storm as she brands me with her stripes. So, um, so I went to India to the tiger forests because I wanted to see tigers for myself close up. And um, uh, I didn't know very much about the Indian wildlife, but I soon discovered it and the incredible um, birds. And this is the green bee eater. More precious than all the gems of Jaipur, the green bee eater. If you see one singing tree, 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 with his space black bill and rufous cap, his robes all shades of emerald, like treetops glimpsed from a plain, his blue cheeks, black eye mask, and the delicate tail streamer like a plume of smoke. You might dream of the forests that once clothed our flying planet. And perhaps his singing is a spell to call our forests back. Tree, 
by tree by tree. So my, um, my grandmother brought me up when I was a baby and then I went back to Paris to my parents, well, not really my parents, to homes and things. And then I went back to my grandmother when I was seven until the age of 13. And a jungle owlet is a day flying owl. Jungle owlet. What you didn't tell me is how poachers cut off their claws and break bones in one wing so they can't perch or fly, that their eyes are sold as pujas, boiled in broth, so herdsmen can see in the dark. You didn't say how sorcerers keep their skulls, their barred feathers, their livers and hearts, or how they drink their blood and tears. You didn't mention how a tortured owl will speak like a young girl to reveal where treasure is buried. My kind granny who took me in when I was homeless, who sat down this very evening after I had gone to bed and wrote mother a stern letter, telling her that she must take me back. It doesn't matter where, Paris, Wales, Timbuktu, no more excuses. You are tired. And here, your slanted writing is almost illegible. But what I think it says is that you cannot look after a teenage owlet. You use your favorite pet name. I've never spoken of this before. I call it up my gullet from the pit at the bottom of my 13th year, along with my crushed bones my stolen blood, and I spit it out through my torn off beak in language that passes for human. So um, then I went to live with my mother in South Wales and um, the other thing about the tiger forests is the amount of deer there, all different kinds, and of course their dinner, tiger dinners. Um, this poem I'm reading for John Glenday, who requested, requested it. Thank you for asking for it. My Velvet. The first thing that happened when we arrived at the new house, the last act of my teens, let me remember it, even the pain, even the sawing sound as I sat obedient on the wooden chair. Let me commemorate my antlers. How I used to admire each new time in the mirror above my doe eyes that boys liked. Let me have one glance at the human who stands ab above me with her hacksaw, who says they must be short now, stubs of my pretty velvets. I do not flinch, even though blood pours down my cheeks. Mother says they are made of keratin and don't hurt but they were pulsing with nerves, enough for me to avoid low branches. I have left the wild and my herd. I am a tame fawn now, childish, so that mother feels better. She scrubs my face clean of shadow and eyeliner. She sucks the blood from the antlers to make herself young. I find that poem quite hard to read. 
Uh, this is requested by Amy Wack, Indian Paradise Flycatcher. Your tail, two comets of ice crystals, your face a night blue sheen, as if dipped in starlight, your wings snowdrifts from a past climate. You descend in a heat haze, and when you dip into a pool, you're a pen skywriting on a mirror, a flick of flakes melting, a jet's contrails telling us about a sun fueled by frost. Too fast for my eye, your tail streamers weave an alphabet to cool the earth. You dinosaur relic, little white flag from the Holocene. And the last poem I'm going to read from Tiger Girl is, um, was requested by Chris Arning. And this is Walking Fire. So in it, there's a reference to um, the, the best part of, of um, the tiger forest that I went to, which was called Tala Zone in Bandavgar National Park. There were three national parks that I went to and Bandavgar was um, very plentiful for tigers. And there, there was um, Queen Spotty, Spot T, capital T, um, because of a calligraphic T above her eye. Walking fire. It's high summer and the grass hisses where the tigress treads. Her pad soundless on the tinder track. Her flanks sway, the cubs cool in their amniotic sacs. She is a walking fire. Her glance a flare that singes my lashes. I seem to be watching her through a veil of snow or ash, the sky as I know it falling, falling. And when her face comes into focus, it's like the membrane between us tears. She brushes against the jeep as she saunters past on the long patrol of her realm, her fur dripping, after a soak in the stream. Can you see me, Gran, I ask. I'm as close to a tiger as you once were, but I won't touch. A baby wouldn't alarm her, but I would. You're sitting opposite saying, it was like staring at a frozen sun. Your eyes grow coal black as you think of the day you were left alone in a tent. I'm staring at the fire in the living room, anthracite glowing with forests of our coal age, flickers of fern, horsetail, club moss, embers spitting onto the mat, like saber-tooths springing from a cave. That split second when we startle and everyone is still alive, even my first cat, not yet given stripes, by the combine harvester as he lay curled in corn. I'd walk over hot coals to get back to you, just to ask one more question about your tiger. But you were only a baby, and probably you only remembered remembering, not the thing itself. Just as now, I'm only half remembering the ghost of your fire, where we sit like two Ice Age Queens worshipping the heat, while underneath us the compressed beds of trees buckle under mountain building. The tigress has passed by now and is ahead on the path, rolling over the sand, belly up, reveling in her power. Already she spawned three sets of cubs and they forged their own empires. When she leaps onto a stag, the whole world slows to hear the grass speak from inside the deer, slows enough to listen 
to what trees have to say with the mouths of storms through their leaves. When I firewalked through the dawn of your death, my feet scorched on the cinder path to your house. When I've opened the gate of your garden, like opening the gate to Tala Zone, where wildlife is almost safe, I will land in your armchair in the deepest cave. And then, Gran, we will talk again about the forests that once reigned on Earth the mysteries of beasts who passed through them, the flames of their spirits surging under fur, not one spark escaping, how even their roars are relics of when the great woods blazed, how it was we who discovered fire and with our knowledge lit the fuse. So now I'm going to read uh, a poem for Marian Fielding. Um, it's from the Zoo Father, and it does come with a trigger warning. Self-portrait with fire ants. To visit you, Father, I wear a mask of fire ants. When I sit waiting for you to explain why you abandoned me when I was eight, they file in, their red bodies massing around my eyes, stinging my pupils white until I'm blind. Then they attack my mouth. I try to lick them, but they climb down my gullet until an entire swarm stings my stomach. While you must become a giant ant eater, push your long, sticky tongue down my throat, as you once did to my baby brother. French kissing him while he pretended to sleep. I can't remember what you did to me, but the ants know. So, um, and I had a request for Arrival of the Electric Eel, which is the first poem from Fovery, my um, sixth collection. And uh, that was from Focky Nan MacDonald. So the Matses are um, a tribe in the Amazon who wear cat whiskers in their cheeks. So they're also known as the Jaguar people. Arrival of the electric eel. Each time I open it, I feel like a Matzer's girl handed a parcel at the end of her seclusion. My face pierced by Jaguar whiskers to make me brave. I know what's inside, that I must unwrap the envelope of leaves until all that's left squirming in my hands is an electric eel. The positive head, the negative tail, the rows of batteries under the skin, the small, almost blind eyes. The day turns murky again. I'm wading through the bottom of my life when my father's letter arrives and keeps on arriving. The charged fibers of paper against my shaking fingers, the thin electroplates of ink. The messenger drags me up to the surface to gulp air, then flicks its anal fin. 
Never before has a letter been so heavy, growing to two meters in my room. The address, the phone number, then the numbness. I know you must be surprised, it says, but I will die soon and want to make contact. And um, also the last poem from February was, was um, requested uh, by Harriet, Harriet Bradford. And um, hello, Harriet, if you're there. And um, oh, it, it's about Notre Dame de Paris, uh, which is one of my friends. And um, the most special thing about the cathedral is the, is the, um, the bell Emmanuel. Uh, and um, I wrote Fauvery and a gr great deal of Mama Amazonica as well in Paris on writing retreats. And uh, incredibly, you know, it's been burnt since then. But Emmanuel, I believe, survived. Emmanuel. In the last days, after all he said and didn't say, his iron tongue resting in the open bell of his mouth, the belfry of his face asleep, I climbed the spiral steps of the tower up the steep steps of the bell cage to the Bourdon, the great bumblebee, Emmanuel. I stared at that bronze weight, the voice of Paris, as if it was my father's voice and I had climbed up his spine, all 13 tons of copper and tin, the clapper half a ton of exorcised iron. I washed the outside with holy oil for the sick, the inside with chrism. Let all badness be banished when he rings. Let the powers of the air tremble. The hail and lightning that fell from his tongue on our last days together. I made the sign of the cross. His note was F sharp the hum deep enough to reverberate through the rest of my life. I stood upright in him. I placed myrrh inside his mouth, incense smoking like a last cigarette. I praised him. I assembled the priests. I mourned his death. Storm clouds dispersed, thunderbolts scattered, I told in Sabbaths, I raised my father's life to its hoists and rang him until I was deaf. I proclaimed peace after bloodshed. So I think I have just time to read um, a few poems from Mama Amazonica. And um, the hospital haircut was requested by Lee McKenzie. I don't think I've read this before. So this is just, is actually was the last time I saw my mother when she was in hospital. The hospital haircut. When I last saw my mother, she was sitting inside a shaft of sunlight, her auburn hair still red. The hospital hairdresser drew up strands so fine, it was like looking at fiber optic threads. Maman's eyes were closed. The corners of her lips trembled. The freckles on her face were lit like the spots on a deer, but her skin was pale as a python that has spent its entire life under a heat lamp in a tank. She opened her eyes and saw me 
I had not visited for years. Her hazel irises were cages for creatures that wanted to break out and eat me. When she spoke, her mouth was the place where a python tries to swallow a doe, then vomits it because it's too large. The hairdresser continued combing through all this. The curls sparked as if they wanted to sprout antlers. Those chignons of her glamorous past, she'd tamed with backcombing and elnet and a thousand pins. Maman acknowledged me, then she closed herself to all but the kind hands that stroked. Her tongue flicked over her dry lips like a snake's, but I knew it was the tongue that had talked to angels as they swept their great wings over her forehead when she was nine. My child mother with a sheet pulled over her face against the wingtip piercing her small window. The miracle of how such a vast being could get through. Then the icy touch on her brow that let in the visions, the fairies that danced on her ceiling. When she lifted her glance to me one last time, all I heard was the snip of the scissors. All I saw were filaments fluttering in a halo around her head, her fairy wings, angel feathers fallen on the floor, and her thoughts locked inside her now cropped scalp like a wildfire. And um, thank you very much for listening. And I'm just going to read one last poem where in Mama Amazonica, um, the, the Amazon rainforest is mainly, is sometimes imagined as a patient, a psychiatric patient. And sometimes it's my mother who is the Amazon rainforest. And in this poem, it is the, um, the Amazon rainforest who is undergoing a sleep cure or sleep treatment, which is what my mother had, one of the many things that she had. Rainforest in the sleep room. The highway goes through the Amazon's brain, like an ice pick through an eye socket. First, we clear her synapses. Then she forgets her animals. Our bulldozers drive through the rainbow boa of her cortex like a scalpel, those sleeping coils still dreaming up new species. Hallucinations we've blitzed with ECT. The bilateral current purrs through her frontal lobes like a forest of songbirds electrocuted by rain. Afterwards, her thoughts are nestless, except for a few chicks up in the last ironwoods, patrolled by armed guards. Scientists climb ropes to monitor her stats, bring motherless macaws down to incubators, measuring their wings weighing naked souls. As if she's a patient in the sleep room who won't wake, her dreams tree lines traced by the EEG pen. The only animals left are grainy films on camera traps and a recording of the last musician Wren who still small voice is like the beginning of the world. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Pascal. Here.